Day Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Matt Dillahunty. Joining me this week, Tracy Harris. Welcome back. Thanks. Hoorah. I have on my special safari hat because yesterday the ACA went to the San Antonio Zoo where I got this hat because I was dumb enough to go out without one. Uh, so we're live today, September 28th, 2008. We wanted to welcome everybody uh, who's watching the show live and those of you who are watching the podcast or video portion of the show that's available at Google Video. Um, you can visit, find out more about uh, the television show at www.atheist-experience.com. We are a live public access television program taking calls and sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. For more about the ACA, you can visit the ACA's website, which I got those backwards. See, they were on the screen the other way around. You can visit the ACA's website, www.atheist-community.org. Also on the website, there's a frequently asked questions page, which will address many of the questions that were frequently asked. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't get through on the telephone today or you don't want to, you can email tv at atheist-community.org. That goes to myself, most of the people behind the scenes, most of the co-hosts. And while we can't promise to answer every one of them, especially now that we're getting more email than, well, anybody, God maybe, uh, we, do, we do read them all and we do appreciate all feedback, criticism, questions, concerns, um, and we'll, we'll do what we can to answer as many as we reasonably can. Uh, in some cases, you're better off uh, hitting up one of the forums or online discussion uh, sites that we host as well, or the Frequently Asked Questions page. The ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road beginning at around 11.30, except for the first Sunday of the month when we host a lecture series at the Austin History Center located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. Next month's lecture will be our own Russell Glasser. who will be talking about... Atheist evangel uh, evangelizing, I guess. I don't, I don't know what his exact topic is, but he's going to talk about the right and wrong ways um, to kind of promote uh, atheism. And I, you know, Russell can probably call in right now and correct me if he's watching. Uh, as I mentioned, we went to the zoo yesterday, had a really good time. Um, uh, I'd never been to the San Antonio Zoo before. I really liked it. I was disappointed that there were no elephants and no great apes. Uh, but apart from that, it was a lot of fun. Lots and lots and lots and lots of birds. And as a, a fan of birds, I had a particularly good time at the, the lorry landing Lord where Keith? you feel, go feed the lorry heats. Oh, yeah. And you walked in with a thing of nectar, and the next thing you know, there's five or six really beautiful birds climbing all over you, which was kind of fun, <laughs> and fighting each other to get at that nectar. In addition to this program, the ACA also sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio podcast called The Nonprofits. You can find out more information about that at nonprofitsradio.com. We don't take calls on the show, but we do run a chat service in conjunction with it. There's information there on how to connect live. And thanks to some of the listeners, we are no longer limited to the 31 slots uh, for live listeners that I was hosting directly from my machine. Um, we've got a listener who's logging in early and setting up two additional feeds. So if you had previously tried to log in uh, live and, and got locked out because we hit the maximum like we do every week, uh, you can try again uh, this coming Saturday. And it's a good Saturday to do it because we've got a guest, uh, Guy P. Harrison, author of the book 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God. Um, We'll be, we'll be calling into the show. It'll be our, our second kind of major guest. I talked to him a little bit on Facebook. I'm, I'm going through his book now, and uh, we're really looking forward to having him on to talk about this as well. He's got a slightly different approach from some of the other atheists and, and, or books that have been skeptical or critical of religion. He's, he's got a slightly different approach to it, and, and so far I'm really enjoying it, so we'll look forward to talking to him next week. Uh, in addition, after the program's over, we get together for dinner. Currently, we're going to Threadgills on Riverside. The address will be up on your screen. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come to any of our events. Uh, you don't have to be a member to attend. We, the show's over at 4.30. We'll be down there around 5 o'clock until everybody's ready to leave. Um, and lastly, coming up next week, everything changes. Well, all right, not everything. I'll still be here. I mean, you're stuck with me. But we're, we're moving from Channel 10 to Channel 16, and we're moving time slots from instead of 3 to 4.30 like we are now. Next week we'll be on from 4.30 to 6. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. We're also probably making some changes to the co-host rotation to try and get some, some more people involved. Um, we're really looking forward to getting on Channel 16 because we found out that 
the campus where there are 50,000 students and a potential pool of people who might be interested in, in carrying on discussions on the show, uh, they don't get Channel 10. So the move to 16 should, uh, should open up more of Austin to the show. And for those of you who aren't in Austin, of course, you won't notice any changes at all. You'll still get your podcast, and the video will be available at Google Video, just like normal. So we're, we're looking forward to the move, and let everybody know. We'll probably remind you two or three times through the show. Uh, so next week, you don't tune in here and say, hey, those guys aren't on the air. And that's the end of the announcements. I can put up, like, the pause bar for all the people who are fast-forwarding through the announcements. So how are you doing? Good. Are we, what, what are we talking about, and do we want to start or take this call? Let's go ahead and take the call. Somebody dove in early. Britton, is that the name? Uh, yes, hello. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent, excellent. Um, I was wondering, have you heard about the best news article ever against Christianity and atheism? came out last week. Seems the Church of England owes Charles Darwin an apology is the title. Yeah. I think we may have mentioned that on last week's show, but I can't remember for sure. It's uh, Reverend Malcolm Brown saying that he calls for a reapproach between Christianity and Darwinism. How about that? Um, too little, too late. Really? I, 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 I don't see what the big deal is. I mean, um, I guess it's nice. Yeah. Uh, but you've already got, you know, it's not like it's going to be necessarily changing a whole lot of people's minds. Hopefully, hopefully this type of thing um, may get some of the more um, sheep-like members of churches to say, oh, okay, now the church says this is okay, so now I don't have to consider it um, evil. Uh, but, you know, it's... I don't know that the Church of England is necessarily a, a major detractor from evolutionary theory. Well I would bring up the Bible verse that Jesus did say, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. Meaning, if you got Christians believing in what the Church of England believes, that, you know, we should believe in Darwinism, and other Christians who don't believe it, well, Jesus said, you cannot argue amongst each other, or else your entire foundation church cannot stand. Okay. Meaning, yeah, Christianity is just completely wrong. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I guess the fact that the church has stood with a divided house for the last 150 years kind of disproves what Jesus was saying. Uh, but, you know, I think they'd probably argue that they hadn't been standing particularly well and this move might affect uh, how well they, they stay together. I like the fact that, um, you know, we're seeing, or, you know, some of the wrongs righted. I mean, the Catholic Church took 300 and some odd years to apologize for, for what they did to Galileo. And, uh, now the the Catholic Church is trying to get a donor to build a statue. Uh, you know, the Church of England's coming out, and they're they're going to say we're going to uh, they they've apologized to Darwin and and, ad, and admitted actually fault in being wrong instead of shifting the blame. I guess it's nice, uh, but I'm not going to you know give them a big round of applause because uh, first of all, it's it's like saying well we don't keep slaves anymore despite the fact that our religious book says that we should and tells us exactly how to do it. Well, I, two years ago, the Church of England did apologize for their role in the transatlantic slave trade, so they kind of went back on their own Bible. Right. They've done, three, they've, they've done it three times now. Yeah, I, you know, and, and while I'll give them, you know, partial credit for eventually um, saying, yep, we were wrong about that, I mean, at least it shows something, um, the fact is that it's, like I said, it's too little too late. Um, you shouldn't, if you, if your religious beliefs are such that you have to be dragged kicking and streaming to reality and then only after centuries of being forced to live among rational people uh, who accept uh, scientific evidence and who have moral standards that don't include slavery and things like that, if it takes that long, um, you're, you're kind of late to the party. We're glad you caught up. Now maybe you can catch up to us on the rest of this stuff. Exactly. And one more thing I want to point out. Uh, basically, they're going back on everything you know, God, Jesus said, because the Bible is just written by mortal men. Have you ever heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Code of Hammurabi? The Code of Hammurabi? Oh, yeah, both. And actually, yeah, Tracy well, talked a little bit about Gilgamesh. 
Oh, yeah, I don't know if I spoke about it, but, but yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it predates Moses by 700 years. I mean, obviously, Moses plagiarized from the Babylonians. And Christians believe, no, no, it's not that. Uh, Moses got it from a burning, talking bush, which is yeah. illogical. Yeah, and Tracy did a series of shows on, on how aspects of Judaism were lifted from Canaanite. Canaanite myth. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and let her get on to the topic. I appreciate the call, Britton. Thanks for calling right. in. Well, thank you so much. Love the show. Sure. Thanks. So you can go ahead and okay. tell us what we're talking about. And I'm going to take off yeah. my hat. Um, yeah, I, I picked the song Building a Mystery because I think that uh, the more I dialogue um, with apologists, the more I feel like that's what I, what's happening. So it... it the, the more they talk, the less I understand about what it is they're trying to explain to me. And in a recent conversation that was on the TV list, um, I just had no luck in getting somebody to explain to me uh, the, the very small phrase. It sounds like nothing. God exists. And it's a very small phrase. It's two words. And yet those two words uh, are complete mystery. Um, there's nothing in them that I understand as far as getting somebody to explain to me what they mean by God and getting somebody to explain to me how they're using the term exists. And the problem that I wanted to read a couple of responses that I got in order to illustrate the problem. Because it shouldn't be a problem. It I mean, really if you say should. like butterflies exist, right? Um, we're kind of talking in the same language and we, right. we've got... You know, definitioning right. and understanding of each right. other. Right, and that's a great example, okay? So if you say to me that a butterfly exists, even if I have no idea what a butterfly is, you can very easily describe it to me. It's, you know, they, they range in size. They can be tiny or they can be about that big. Sometimes they get, you know, real big if they have big wings. But they have, you know, for the most part, colorful patterned wings that are, you know, kind of opaque generally, sometimes iridescent. They've got six, I think they have six legs, maybe eight, I don't know. But antenna, the probesis kind of tongue, they eat. Now, you can give me a very detailed description of what you mean by a butterfly when you're, when you're saying it. And if everything else fails, you can, we can go outside and you can grab me and say, there's a butterfly. Right. So... There's a referent in reality that we can point to, and even if we don't have that referent available, we can offer a very detailed description of what exactly you mean by butterfly. So even if you're talking to someone who lives in Antarctica, you can still describe the thing to them in terms that they can understand. It has wings, it has legs, it has, you know, and so it's a very, there's a, there's a way, it's well defined, it's uh, observable, it manifests, it's a, it's a fairly obvious item, and so there's, it's very easy to get past that first part, butterfly, butterflies. And then exists would pretty much be along the lines of how you would normally use it. I think if I said to a per if I just walked into a room and said, give me an example of something that exists, I think most people would grab whatever's sitting there and just say, oh, okay, existence is, you know, here, well, what do we mean by that? We mean manifestation. The thing directly, observably, um, you know, manifests and you can measure the manifestation. We can measure how hard this mug is. We can measure the weight of, you know, Muhammad. We can, you can measure light frequencies. There's, there's like a whole range of measurements for existence and basically things that manifest and things that can be measured are what we consider to be the realm of existence and what we're talking about when we say exist. So when I get into a discussion with an apologist, we have two problems. Uh, the first one, of course, is that they're giving me the item, God, which has no external referent that they can generally point to. There are some uh, exceptions to this, like the pantheists we use a lot, because they, they put forward that the universe is God, and so to them, all of this would be God. And on some level, that's almost like also a Hindu idea, where you've got the divinity of everything. So, you know, but you're putting forward that if, if everything is, is God to a person, I may or may not agree that I would call it God, but at least they're, they're able to communicate to me what they mean by the term God. Right, and it's the same, the same is true for, for like um, 
uh, Greek and Roman myths, where they had these anthropomorphized beings who had specific domains and specific responsibilities. Right. You know, this is the god of war, and he right. can do this, and this is you know the god of thunder, and he can do this. And somebody pointed out, and I think it kind of meshes really nicely, is that even something that we have no reason to think exists, like unicorns, we can still come up with a description for it. We can right. still say, this is what a unicorn is. This right. is what I mean when I'm using the label. Right. And Oh, that's, and I, that's actually a really good, uh, something that needs to be touched on, is that ideas exist, but they exist in a way that most of us understand they're in our heads. Right. Um, so a lot of times people will say, not everything that exists has like such a, such an obvious manifestation. Sometimes you have a thing like love that, you know, yes, there's this chemis chemistry to it, but then there's this feeling and there's a manifestation of the action of love and you can't really prove that I love you, I can act like I love you. And, but the point about love is that it is an internal idea, it is a, a man-made concept that each person holds uh, the model of love in their own mind and it is whatever you define it as. Now, of course, there's like general parameters to where we understand that it's, for example, not, um, you wouldn't confuse it with something like hate or jealousy, although uh, some people might actually take someone else's definition of love and, and say that that's the equivalent of hatred, where someone might say, I loved my spouse so much that I murdered them because I couldn't bear the thought of them being with someone else. And to that person, that's what love entails, is some sort of an actual you know, connection that, that is uh, ownership and that is um, you know, commitment that you, know, you will kill them if they, if they break that commitment or they break that um, sense of ownership that you're holding in, in, with love. You know, we talked about it before with particularly, I mean, and we obviously, um, I think most believers and most of us would agree that these people are uh, deranged, that something got right. wrong, but when you talk about a woman who kills her children in order to send them off to heaven quicker, um, from her perspective, she's doing something that right. she thinks is loving and right. not evil. But the, my, my main point she's is wrong, that if, if you really get around to asking people um, what do they mean by love, how does love manifest, what does love entail, you'll find that there are different models and that people have different models of this. And one person's love is another person's monstrosity. And, you know, it, it, there's just, because it is a, a mental concept held inside the mind, um, it has that amorphous quality that cannot clearly be communicated from one person to another. You will never know what I mean by love. And I'll never know what someone else means by it. They can communicate it to the best they can communicate it. And sometimes when they communicate it, I might think, I wouldn't call that love. But that's what they call love. And that's what it is to them. And that's what happens when you deal with a concept. But that isn't what happens when you deal with a referent. Right. When you have an external objective referent like this mug, there's not a lot of discrepancy as far as what color is this, how hard is this, how deep is this. I mean, it's measurable. And whether somebody wants to believe that it's, you know, maybe four inches deep or not is really, you know, certainly they can believe that, but they can be proven wrong. Yeah. And you can show that the mug is as deep as the mug is by simply pulling out a ruler. Well, I think it also kind of ties the two together. I mean, talking about love, you've got people in, in several of the monotheistic modern religions where either they'll just flat out say God is love um, or their attempt to define or, or not define their God makes it um, the rough equivalent where God has just become a concept almost and yet they've they've transposed this to where they think no 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 it's not just a concept right it's real and it exists right and that's what i want to say it's like as far as the argument and i i i, I hesitate to even call it an argument but the uh, the putting forward of the idea that you know god exists like love exists to me that's i just put that one right out the window because i know of no one who would sit there and argue about the existence of god who is seriously putting forward that god exists merely as a mental concept um, every theist that's come to our list to go to the wall to explain that they believe God exists, they are, they are loath to say that God is a concept in their own mind. I have yet to hear one person say, yes, that's exactly what I mean. God is a concept of mind just like love. If that's all you're thinking, there's, you're going to find very few atheists who are going to argue with you about that because most atheists will agree that God is, is a concept, a model in your mind. But if you want to say that there is an objectively existing 
entity of some sort, something outside your head that exists in the external realm of existent reality, of objectively existing reality beyond yourself, then that whole idea of God exists like love exists doesn't apply anymore. Right. So now we're looking at an objective reality, which is a measurable reality, and where um, the way that we know and test a concept, so if, if me and Matt get into an argument about whether or not this mug is um, deeper than two inches or not deeper than two inches, it can be resolved. We simply have to examine the mug, measure how many inches deep it is, and we will know who is correct and who is incorrect. Where you lack an external reference, the problem becomes, upon what do you base your model? <laughs> okay, And that's a big problem. Because if there's nothing upon which to base your model, and somebody makes a claim about God, God is loving, well, I, there is, I can't measure that. I don't know. You're claiming that, but I don't know. And I can't check your claim against the external referent to see if what you're telling me is accurate. So without having something to examine, I have your claim or someone else's claim, but I have nothing to examine in order to confirm that claim is accurate. Yeah, and in order for the concept to actually work, I mean, going back to like the mug analogy, um, not only do you, do you need to be able to define it specifically and explain it, but we need to be using common terms. And that means that if we're going to measure how deep that is, we need a, a standardized unit of measure that we're right. both going to agree on. Right. So that, you know, I don't, I don't all of a sudden say that, well, I'm, when I say two inches, that equals two feet for you. Correct. And, and you hear similar things with regard to this, this God claim as well. You know, um, when we talk about whether or not God's moral, uh, the, this concept of God that's presented in the different religions, whether or not that, that is something we would consider morally true, um, or whether or not we, we think that it's logically reasonable to right. get to this God, then you get these claims of, well, that's because you're measuring by man's standards right. and not God's standards. Well, okay. I mean, if you want to, if you want to say that, you know, invisible pixies exist and we, you're measuring them by the invisible pixie standards, that's great, but now you've got to tell me what those standards are and we have to agree that that's a good measurement for this. So. Right. So we run into an issue where the person, if they want to have a dialogue about God, they need to be able to explain what it is they're describing, what it is they're referring to, what it is that I'm supposed to be acknowledging. And I wanted to read some excerpts from one of the dialogues that happened recently because it gives a really good example of the problem that occurs. And, and when you're an atheist and you're trying to talk to somebody about their concept of God, it becomes problematic when they give you answers like this. I'm sorry about that. I could, if I could explain God in the way you want me to, then I would pretty much be a God myself. His glory is too great even to come close to understanding anything about the nature of his existence. And another response we got to someone else on the same question is, and it's the same person putting this out, but by no means is this person unique in their description. I mean, this is not something that we rarely hear. This is par for the course. Um, here he is again trying to describe it. This is the awesome glory of God. I don't have a clue as to what he is, none whatsoever. This is what makes him so magnificent because there is nothing in, in this world that could explain or describe or imagine what his glory is like. We only say God and he because it is the best way for us to identify who we are talking about, but that doesn't describe what he is like or what he is made of or anything. A thing we can describe, God we cannot. And let me tell you that the, the last part of that paragraph is something that most atheists would give a hearty amen to because it does seem like a thing you can describe, but God, you cannot. And it also seems like we don't know who or what or you know, what we're talking about or anything about it. So if this is the description that I'm getting back and I'm trying to have a conversation with someone about God exists and I can't get past God, I don't know how to have that conversation. Yeah, and, and I, you know, while, while I wouldn't have phrased it this way, and I certainly wouldn't have started with this is the awesome glory of God, the idea that you're, you're, you're saying, I believe in this thing that I can't possibly understand, I can't comprehend, I can't even imagine, I can't describe, I can't know anything about. Why would anybody believe in that? I well, mean, what is, what that? is it you're believing in? Right. I mean, 
how can you say that I can't comprehend it, but I believe it? Right. I can't understand it. I can't describe it, but I believe it. Right. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know there. what it is I'm supposed to be understanding that you believe when this is the response. Um, I have no idea what. I mean, if, if it if you can't make sense of it, and you can't understand it, how in the world can you possibly expect to communicate that to someone else? And, and what does that say, for example, if they're if we extend it into what they're what they're normally talking about, where this is a God that created you, and He specifically created you in a manner that you're unable to comprehend, understand, identify, describe, or in any way know anything about it. Now, I realize that not all believers necessarily fall into this category, but if you're in that category, if you can't, I mean, you don't even know what this thing is that you don't understand, and yet you're, you're believing it, and then eventually you get the justification that I believe it because, you know, he made me or he made everything, that type of thing. Uh, well, how do you know that? How do you know there's a they, there's any there there? I mean, it's just it's it's maddening. And well, I mean, it's it's basically a description of nothing. I mean, it, there, it's a description of nothing, and then I'm supposed to talk about it like it's something, and I don't know how to do that. And I think that's what I'm trying to to say today is there is a a, a, a definitional divide, I think, between like apologists and atheists that. There, it's no wonder to me that communication doesn't happen or that it's so difficult when a person who is offering that sort of a description for God does not understand the non-information they're providing. They're providing me a whole bunch of words and saying nothing. They're describing nothing. They have given me zero information in that paragraph. They've just spent an entire paragraph explaining to me why they can't explain to me God, and yet they want to dialogue with me about God. Well, if I want to have a conversation with someone about God, they have got to be able to tell me what they're talking about. If you can't tell me what you're talking about, there cannot be a conversation. So I would say before you approach somebody to discuss your God, you need to sit down and do some reflection and try to figure out what you mean by that word, specifically what you mean. And I also don't mean what do you think God does. I mean what do you think God is because what you think God does is really irrelevant until there is a, shown to be a God that is. Um, you can tell me all day long, God creates worlds, God wrote the Bible, God, and I cannot confirm any of it because I have no God to go to and examine and say, you know what, that's correct, this God does, did write the Bible. Um, and that's the other problem that we had with this particular person was the idea that the evidence that was being put forward on behalf of his God's existence all assumed that God existed. So you would have um, the Bible put forward, and it's like, well, God created the Bible, and so here's the Bible, and this is evidence for God. And it's like, well, but if there is no God, then God didn't create that book. So I can't, you can't come to me when, when what we're trying to determine is whether or not there is a God and say you've got this book that is the product of that God, and you want to enter that into evidence for your God, um, and I should accept it as evidence because it was created by your God. Well, if the point of contention is whether or not God exists, of course I'm not going to accept that the book is created by God. We need to establish first there is a God that could create the book. Then we can talk about whether or not he did create the book. There may be a good test too though. I mean if you're, if you're doing it in written communication, take a second because you know, looking at what the person wrote, if you take out your gods and he's uh, and it's if you want and sub in something I put X a lot of times. Nothing, right or XPDR, just in any string of characters, and it makes as much sense if, if, it's, if, if you're conveying exactly uh, no information either way, right. then there's a problem. Right, and we're gonna get to that too. The other question that comes up is what is meant by exist? So we go through the whole thing with God, we can't define God, we don't understand God, I have no more information about God, and then I'm wondering, if you can't give me any data, and you have no way to measure, to examine, to then what do you mean by exist? Because when I use the term exist, I'm talking about the measurable objective reality around me. And if I can't, if, there, if, if, if there's no measurable way to examine this thing that you're talking about, how then is it that you're considering it part of existence? And what do you mean by the word exist at this point? And how do you tell? things that exist from things that do not if we're going to include non-manifesting items in the realm of existent items. That becomes a problem. 
So what I wrote to the person was that existence, as far as I know, is the term we use to define the set of all items that can be shown to directly manifest to people. To say that any item exists indicates that it manifests in some direct manner. If you cannot show a direct manifestation of any god, then you have no actual reason to put forward a god exists. If existence is not manifestation to you, please define the term exist as you apply it. And if, you use, if your use of exist does not require direct manifestation, please explain how you differentiate between things that exist and things that do not exist. I assume I should clarify that you're putting forward God exists in the present and not that God is merely a past event that no longer exists, such as a deist might put forward. To me, that question is very clear. How do you define existence? How do you tell the difference between things that exist and things that don't if you're not using manifestation as your measure? I don't know how I could have been any more clear. The answer I got back is, for this, you'll need faith. I can't show you God. God will show himself to you in his own ways when you have faith. And trust me, you'll know it's him, but it's all up to you. The best I can do is show you the truth about Jesus, who is the manifestation of God in human flesh. Uh. Now, all I asked was, how do you define existence? And how do you tell things that exist from things that do not? And the answer I got back was, I can't show you God. OK, I didn't ask him to show me God. I didn't ask him how I can see God. I didn't ask him, uh, you know, all I said was, how do you define existence? And how do you tell things that exist from things that do not? And I did not get an answer to the question. Unless you, you ask the question, how do you tell the difference between things that exist and things that don't? And if you take his first sentence, for this you'll need faith, <laughs> Maybe that was his answer. I just take it on faith that whatever I happen to believe in actually my exists. Point, my point is the, the, the question I asked really is divorced from, you know, can be divorced from whether or not we're even talking about God. Right. How do you define existence and how do you tell things that exist from things that don't? No, I'm saying his answer may, I, I don't think it's, I'm, I'm being kind of funny. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying, I mean, yes, he w I wouldn't probably accept that he is saying it's that really, I need faith for everything. It's really a way of saying, I don't try to tell the difference between what exists and what doesn't <laughs> well, exist. Maybe if not. I feel like believing in uniform, unicorns, I'll just take that on faith. So then he told me... Believe um, me, you'll know they're real when they gore you through the stomach with that horn. He, when he said he couldn't show me God, I said, if God does not manifest like every other existent item manifests, what are you defining as existence? Again, I didn't say, if God doesn't manifest like every other item that exists manifests, so therefore your God doesn't exist. All I said was, what are you defining as existence? If God doesn't manifest like every other item manifests in existence, what are you defining as existence? That's a very straightforward question. The answer I got was, you want a natural explanation for a supernatural being. That doesn't work. Apparently, you think supernatural isn't that super and just a tad bit more than natural. The best thing we have are miracles he's performed for us in our lives. That's the manifestation you're going to get. Again, I didn't ask for an explanation about I didn't. All I said was, what are you defining as existence? And no answer. No answer. I get more of an apology about God and you know why you can't. And I'm not asking him, why can't we see God? I'm saying, what are you defining as existence? And I got no answer. I don't know what he means by existence. So I tried again. <laughs> I said, I'm unbiased enough to be willing to accept that you have some sort of a God that exists if your God can meet the one and only criteria I am aware of for existence, measurable manifestation. When I ask you what you mean, when you then may, mean by exist and existence, and how you tell things that exist from things that do not, you say I'm putting constraints on God. I'm not. I'm merely asking you, and I put that in all caps, you, to define what you mean by exist and existence and how you differentiate that which exists from that which does not. I'm not asking God to provide anything in this request. I'm questioning your model and your definitions and your lack of support. I'm not asking anything from God. And then the answer I got was, do I believe that Jesus is a real person? I know that at least you once did, but what about now? Trust me, I'm not dodging your question. As a, as a quick reminder while we hold off on, on this real quick, um, the telephone number is up on your screen if you're, if you're wanting to call in. Um, we're on the air till 4.30, and then after that we go to dinner at Thread Gills down on Riverside. Any, anybody's welcome to join us, any atheist or atheist-friendly person. Um, we, you can call in. We're, we're going to continue discussing this, but I want to make sure people that knew that, they, that the phone lines were open. And, you know, 
if you want to call in and give, you know, normally I ask, what do you believe in why? I mean, that's what I want the most. Tell me what you believe in why, we can figure out where we disagree, where we don't. And the point that Tracy's kind of addressing is the one that we almost duck and dodge on the show, too. When somebody calls in to make their argument or make their case for, for what they believe, um, sometimes we, we try to get them to define terms and sometimes we don't. Sometimes the, the frustration is too great and we just presume that, okay, whether anybody understands what you're actually talking about or not, let's at least hear what your argument is. Maybe it'll make sense after the fact. Uh, but if you know if you've got a definition of God or you've got some understanding, um, you know, or, or some insight into this, if you think that you could answer direct questions better than some of the apologists that we've had in email, please feel free to give us a call. And as a last reminder, next Sunday everything changes. We're moving to Channel 16 from 4:30 to 6 p.m. And I'll talk more about that later. <laughs> okay. All right, so we really didn't get, uh, I never got an explanation for what does he mean by exist and how does he define it and how he tells things that exist from things that don't exist. And the answer about Jesus is, I mean, I, I think I understand what he's trying to do, but the, the problem is that Jesus, you know, lived and died. And even if Jesus at the time he lived was some sort of human manifestation, the problem is we don't have that now. And my point to him earlier was you're not talking about a past God that used to exist. You're talking about a God that you believe exists right now, which means that you're saying this thing is right now. So why isn't it manifesting right now? Why do we have to go back 2,000 years to look for a manifestation of something you say is here now? I mean, it, it's not, it, there's a difference between saying it used to be. In that case, I can understand trying to pull from some sort of evidentiary argument about why we would think something used to be. But when you're saying something is, you're making a claim about current state of existence. And so I need to know, currently, when you say God exists, what are you saying about existence? What does it mean to you to exist? And how do you tell a thing that exists from something that doesn't exist? And that has to be clear. And also what has to be clear is what you're talking about when you say God. What is it that is striking you about the world outside you? or you know, what's beyond your brain that makes you say, yes, this thing is out there. What are you seeing? What are you experiencing? What, are you, what is it that you're calling God? What is that referent that's outside your mind? Um, is there one or is there not? You know, and, and if there's not, then please don't be surprised that I don't believe you. Um, and if there is, then sh explain it and let's talk about it. Um, but anyway, the next thing that we tried to discuss was I was trying to make the point, and it seems to me like a no-brainer, but it was so difficult. And I, the whole time I was responding to this person, I remember I just kept thinking, why is this hard? You know, why is this hard? And there was a few times I actually wrote that, and I would say, you know, this, is, this does not have to be this hard. You know, telling me what you mean by existence shouldn't entail a huge you know, explanation about your God. I, I'm just asking you in general, what do you, what do you mean about by existence? That's a, that's a very simple thing. When, yeah. when you're talking about things that exist and things that don't exist, what do you mean by that? And if you don't know what you mean by it, then what you're really saying is you don't know what existence is. And if you don't know what you mean by exist and existence, then how can you make a claim that something exists when you don't know what that means? So you've got to have something in your head that, that is existence. And you're, you're about to shift gears here, uh, but it demonstrates something that we've talked about a lot. Um, I apologize to the, to the regular listeners who um, are fans of the show, sympathetic, and email, who have emailed and not gotten a response. Uh, I, I apologize in part because one of the reasons that you don't get a response is because for whatever reason some of us uh, spend a lot more time answering the emails that come in from apologists or Christians, theists of some stripe, whatever, um, in the hope not only that we'll, we'll develop uh, better ways to explain things on this show when callers call in, um, to try and overcome the communication gaps that Tracy's talking about. But what this this letter is fairly typical in a couple areas, not just in the inability to, to answer a question or communicate a point or come to some common ground um, in order to have a discussion, but it goes from point to point to point without 
any concession at all of I understand this now or I disagree but I have a question about something else it's it's this this um, meandering I they've presented their case we've offered some response and then with no acknowledgement they move on um, when Jeff D was on the show that didn't fly ever it was, and, and Ashley pointed it out to, to me today and reminded me, and it was, no, 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 until you answer the question or until you address that point or acknowledge that we've made a point, or we're not moving on. You don't get to give up on your first argument and then move on to the Big Bang and evolution and, and you know, a, any other thing that you can do um, when we haven't even gotten past the basics. And in this case, we're having a difficult time even getting the basics of two words. Right. Which, which, are, which are the entire claim. Yeah. I mean, there's only two parts to the claim. God exists. And the person can't tell me what God is, and they can't, and they're, not, they're using exist in a, in a way that is obviously not the standard way that it's normally used, but they won't tell me how they're using it. So I have no idea what the claim means. When you're telling me God exists and you cannot explain to me what God is, and you cannot tell me what you mean by existence, I don't know what you're claiming. Yeah, and, and if you I try to assume, yeah. if you try to go with like a generalized definition of God right. um, in order to get to specifics that they can't do, inevitably, without fail, they'll come back, well, that's not the God that yeah, I Yeah, that, that, will, that will consistently... You're, you're unfairly putting words yeah. in my mouth. That, well, if you won't put them in there, then we're done. Right. That will consistently bite you in the ass to yeah. make an assumption about what somebody means when they say God. Because I guarantee you, I have not met two theists who mean the same thing by that word. I have, no, I have not met the two theists that worship the same God. Yeah. And the, uh, the next thing that I was trying to explain to the person was that things that do not exist cannot be the cause of other things. And this became extremely problematic because the, the theist in this case was interpreting me to be saying God cannot be the cause of things because God does not exist. So he was thinking that I was presupposing the atheist stance and therefore right. saying that God cannot be the cause of anything because God doesn't exist. That is not what I was saying. What I was trying to communicate to the theist in this case is that if there is no God, God cannot be the cause of other things. And you can say that about anything. If there is no pen, then the pen cannot be the cause of anything. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to start with a presupposition, I guess, that there is no God. But what I am going to start with is that we need to establish that there is a God before we can start moving forward and saying that that God causes things, that that God manifested as Jesus, that that God wrote a Bible, that that God produced a universe. Maybe it did, but let's sit down and say, do we have an existent God? Is God an existent thing that can cause other things? Because until we have that part down, we can't move forward. Right. And we, we talked about this before, and this is the whole thing, and, and Tracy's completely sold me on it, so I've ended up talking about it on a number of shows about manifestation, and, and we touched on it a little bit ago. Um, what you specifically wrote was things that do not exist cannot be the cause of other things. And the reason for that is, or cannot be the cause of other things that exist. I suppose things that don't exist could be the cause of other things that don't exist, but we, we don't need to contemplate our navels for the rest of the show. Um, if, if something, basically one of the claims from people about God is that it is this, um, well, it, it doesn't manifest because it's this transcendent, otherworldly, outside of reality being, then, it, then what, what you're saying is it can't therefore affect reality in any way at all. Because the second it does, it has by definition manifested in some way. There are lots of things that we can't or couldn't um, see or identify. Um, and yet we saw their effects this led us to hypotheses about what they potentially were, and we began investigating to, to measure and identify how those things manifest. Couldn't see atoms for a very long time, and yet we began to build an understanding of the, the fundamental building blocks of everything in the universe that led us to, uh, well, I mean, the ancient Greeks had some sort of atomic theory long before anybody could have actually seen or measured one. Um, and, and that's just one of the many examples. If there is some effect or some observation, some phenomena in reality, it doesn't matter whether it's caused by something else in reality or if you're willing to go this far, something else outside of reality, 
there's something there that we can look at. That's the manifestation. And if you think your God can do things in reality, then by definition he's become measurable and identifiable and quantifiable. Um, did you want to? Oh, sure. We got uh, Diane. How you doing? Hello. 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 Hey. Hi. Yeah, there's like a four second delay. You might want to ignore the TV and focus on the phone. Um, say that again. I'm sorry. There's like a four second delay, so you may want to just ignore the TV and focus on the phone. But what was your question? Okay. Um, well, basically, what I was calling in, I'm listening to the discussion and. One of the things that I'm trying to understand out of what is being said by, I believe her name is Tracy and yourself, is it, it kind of sounds like her question is, does God exist or do we believe in God being in existence? But then she also pretty much, I feel, contradicted herself because she said we had to come from somewhere, which we all understand, but we understand and believe that where we came from is God. We came from him. He is our creator. And so how does he exist here on earth now? He exists in those who believe that he is God and that that's where his existence is. Just like to say that God doesn't exist and to say that a person can't exist without showing where they came from, the example she gave with the pen, she took the pen away, right. that's, just, that's just like a child who's been born and both of their parents become deceased. Okay, their parents are deceased, but you know they came from somewhere. You know that you're not sitting here without coming from somewhere. Your parents were, came together in the natural, and they gave birth to a child. I so agree. you can no longer go back to your parents and say, okay, this is where I came from because your parents are deceased. So God no longer God exists. in the natural, he... He no longer exists in the natural, but he exists in the spirit. So you're a deist in, in a sense. Like you believe that God kind of got the ball rolling, then stepped back, and he's no longer involved. Is that correct? No, he's very much involved. He's well, very much involved. Well, my he's involved if my parents through are, those who hang on, believe. Hang on. If, I'm just trying to make sure we understand the analogy. If you say, you know, if your parents are deceased, that's, that's the rough equivalent of God. Um, if my parents are deceased, they don't exist anymore. They existed at one time. So what Tracy was asking is, therefore, you seem to think that God existed at some point, but he doesn't exist anymore. My parents he, does don't not, he does not exist anymore in the natural, but he does exist in the spirit. What is spirit? The spirit is an, is a, is an atmosphere. It's what's around us. The spirit is a supernatural existence. What is that? It's it, I just told you, it's a supernatural existence. I don't, we know, believe, I don't know what supernatural is. We believe is. that supernatural is something that is beyond natural abilities. It is existing beyond the natural. Just like if you are a flesh and body human being that sits there, I can reach out and touch you. You are a tangible being. A spirit is something that is supernatural that is not able to be touched by the hands of man, but it is something that we believe that is in existence because we have faith, and we are connected to God because of our faith. So, so you don't have any evidence that there's anything supernatural? You just believe it on faith? I have evidence in, in the things that happen that I know a natural human being can do. I can give you a perfect example. Several years ago, I had a, a tumor in my breast. I refused to go to the doctor. I was afraid to go to the doctor because I, my mother had went through breast cancer. And I found myself crying out in my room. Nobody was there. I cried out and I asked God to heal me. I asked God to remove it. And I asked him, I cried out to Jesus and I asked him, please heal me. This is painful. It's growing. And I was afraid of what it was doing to my body. The very next morning, I woke up. And when I touched, it was as if an incision had taken place. And when I touched my breast, that tumor was no longer there. It was gone. It, it no worked. man, no man touched my body and operated on me. How do, you know, was, how do you know you had a tumor if you're afraid to go to the doctor? Because I could touch it. It was there. I could okay. feel it. So there was so, no diagnosis so, of a tumor. So you self-diagnosed yes. a tumor. And, and then you self-diagnosed no, no. a cure. And then you self-diagnosed a cure. No, I didn't self-diagnose anything. Mm -hmm. When you touch something and you can feel it and it's there, there was a mass. 
That's, that's called self-diagnosis. That, no, it's called. It was a mass there in my breast. I'm not doubting that. I'm not okay, calling you a, a liar. There, uh, there was a mass. But you don't know what it was. You don't know what it was. It was a mass. Yes, you but it could have been. It could have been whatever it was. It could have been a reaction. There, there's, there's, a couple, there. there's a couple of I things. I didn't call y'all to argue with y'all about what about it. I, you asked the question. I gave it. No. And, of course, you're going to continue to challenge it. No. So what I want to know is, just like you asked the question about what is it that we believe, I want to know what is it that you as atheists believe, and where do you believe that you came from? I came because from my I, parents. Right. I, I agree with your earlier statement that I came from my parents. You came from your parents, and where did your parents come from? Where, do, where does the, the existence of human beings tie back to? Where does it go back to? Um, we're not completely sure about the exact process that My took point place, exactly, and that's all I wanted to hear you that's say. Fine. Because you're not sure well, if exactly, all you, if all you're you challenging want to something that you're not well, sure about. Right, because you're, you're claiming that you know. No, 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 no. I'm not challenging something I'm not sure about. You asked where humans came from. Um, you said you're not sure. And, and I right. am happy to say that we don't have a good answer. We right. don't have a good explanation of what sort of abiogenesis occurred. And however, you I'm, however to believe that please, the Bible would you is let me true. talk for a minute? Yes, however, go ahead. I'm not coming on the show saying, ah, we don't know the, how humans. I'm not advocating that point. All I'm saying is, you have no evidence for right. your position. And therefore, there's no reason to believe it. The time to believe a claim is when there's evidence to justify it. And when you come on to talk about a mass, first of all, we don't know what kind of mass because you self-diagnosed. Um, there are people who have, I hate to tell you, you say this couldn't happen. There are people who have masses and they go away. There are people who have cancer and it goes into remission. These things happen. They are statistical realities. To, to because say, our bodies, our bodies have the ability because God created them. Okay, this well, way. you're done. Bye. I mean, if the best you can do is to say, "Oh, I know God did," and then when I explain that these things happen normally, naturally, statistically, there's good medical evidence for it, and then you say, "Well, that's because God made us with the ability to heal ourselves." Okay. I mean, if you just keep pushing it back one step further, one step further, uh, we get nowhere. I would allow, I would I wish, you know. But what this boils down to though is that God to this person was a lump that that went away. Yeah, really? I mean really that's what it boils down to. The entire basis of the belief is supernatural things that occur like and then she gave the example of one that she was sure about from now just from several years ago she said. So I assume this was a significant incident in her mind to remember it several years later and think that it was a supernatural cure and then to say I had this lump and it went away. Well, I go out in my yard every night and th we have something called mosquitoes and I come in with lumps and guess what? Tomorrow they go away. Um, oh, I've had fatty deposits. Yeah, that, that, that go, go away. away. And um, I, you know, I'm not saying the woman had a mosquito bite. I'm just saying lots of things cause right. lumps, and lumps go away. And, and it could have it could have even been a cancerous tumor for all. And when someone when someone says blood. to me the manifestation of God as a supernatural being relies on things like I had a lump and it went away, I mean I don't even know how to respond to that. You're giving me a natural occurrence, and you're saying that this this to you know this this is what I'm talking about when I say God. And it's like well if that's what you're talking about when you say God, I still have no idea what you're talking about. Well, the other thing that. that when she kind of tried to spin off in the direction of where did you come from and where did you come from, you're tracing this infinite regress back. And we talked about this, God knows how many times on the show. Um, the the thing is, at some point you get back to where we both say, I don't know, and the difference is, and you supposedly called in just to hear me say I don't know. The difference is, I say I don't know, and I don't have a particular belief about how it occurred, yet you do. You believe that God created you. And I want to know, where's your evidence for that? Right, I mean, what it, it, reason do you have for believing that? Because if I'm sitting here saying, I don't know how necessarily life got started. We have some good scientific ideas. We, we may be closer to finding out what happened or what likely happened. Um, but I don't have a belief. Uh, I don't necessarily believe any claim about how life formed uh, initially. But the point but is, do. yeah, if, if no one knows, you know, if, if there's a question that, that, isn't, that has no verifiable answer at this point, then saying that you know or, or having an a, asserting knowledge on the topic is an absurd thing to do. I mean, it, you're either, 
I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like unless it's an outright lie, um, you know, then the other option is that you believe it, in which case you're saying, you know, no, there is no evidence and we don't know, but I, I'm saying it's, it's this. And it's like, well, why am I challenging that? Because you have no reason to be saying it. Um, I don't know is an honest answer. Making things up when you don't know is not an honest answer. Yeah, or accepting whatever you know, mom and dad told you, whatever. But evidently, um, we've got. Uh, is it Alicia? Yes. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm pretty good. You were, you were going to explain why, from a scientific standpoint, you you believe in a god? Uh, yes. Um, I study a lot of theoretical physics, and I grew up in a family that. Um, I guess you would call them typical Christians, but um, in my opinion, I wanted to look deeper into the thing and figure out, well, what do I believe personally, and why do I believe it, and is there any kind of scientific basis for it? Sure. And I think that, well, for me and personally, I think that people get confused mainly about the whole God issue because in physics, the way it's explained and there are a lot of theoretical physicists that are turning into believers now because what, of what, The way what's explained? Cause the way that God is explained. God isn't explained in physics. In theoretical physics, it is. What, 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 what theoretical that, physics? That every single thing comes from the void. The void is essentially a nothingness, and it's really difficult to wrap your mind around. Okay, the fact I, that yeah, I don't know what you're saying. I, 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 I'm not... I'm not a physicist, although there is one in the room. Right. I'm not a theoretical physicist, but what I see happening, and I will let you finish to make the point, I promise, is when I say that physics doesn't address God or give a definition of God, which is what you implied, you came back with, well, theoretical physics talks about everything coming from the void and nothingness. Okay, that's fine, but that how, how is that uh, God? Because I, I've yet to hear a theoretical physicist say uh, everything came from God as a, as a physics explanation. I mean, if you're going to equate God and void or God and nothingness, I mean, that's your prerogative. But I'm wondering what, you know, what, what this theoretical phys physics explanation for God is. Yes, I, I guess if I'm understanding you correctly, um, the, what I looked at is, well, I looked at the latest physics research and the latest theoretical physics, and I looked at how people in the Christian world describe God. And when you get down to it, the void is the way the Bible describes God. I don't remember that. Which everything comes from the void. The void is nothingness, but that's where everything comes from. Um, the void is sort of like every single possibility that there could be. All right, first of all, setting aside um, this whole issue of addressing the void in physics, um, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the Bible. I don't recall the Bible ever describing God as the void. If, if, all, if, if your only connection is everything came from God and everything came from the void, okay. Um, everything came from physical snot. I mean, I can put whatever label on it I want. But the Bible has, has while it's not very detailed in describing God, um, does describe God in ways that aren't consistent with the void, including, you know, a, as a personhood with an intelligence directing where you couldn't look directly on him. Um, the, backside parts. Yeah, you, 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 could, you could see the backside yeah. and not die, but the front you can't. Um, I don't, know what I, mean. I don't know how you get to the void. Well, um, in the beginning of the Bible, it talks about uh, everything um, coming from the void. So the earth was the void. No, it, there's no mention of a void. I got one right here. In Genesis chapter 1, a God creates everything, but he is specifically mentioned as anthropomorphic, including he comes down and walks around in the Garden of Eden with, with Adam and Eve. The, the, he wrestles with believers. He acts and does things. This is not a void. This is not, certainly not a void in any sense that physics would describe. Um, okay, that, that, and that gets to my second point. Um, there, just like there are um, creatures in the world that are on a lower evolutionary scale than we are. Wrong. I, no. There Wrong. are beings that okay, are. Okay, stop, stop, please. No. Um, 
I went ahead and let you go into the second point, even though you didn't make any kind of a concession or acknowledgement around the first point, and Jeff would have had a field day with that. Uh, but there's no such thing as an evolutionary ladder, and there's no such thing as p things being lower on an evolutionary ladder. Do you say that because? Because it's true. Evolution isn't a ladder. It's, it's more like a tree. Um, we are all equally evolved. We have just evolved differently. Oh, okay, okay. And by, maybe and I by, misspoke myself then. Well, we've evolved differently, but when you start implying a ladder and that things are more evolved or less evolved, um, that's just wrong. Mutation, random mutation, um, other, other causes occurs and natural selection acts on it. And even if you were to define a scale of, let's say, uh, some particular characteristic, uh, uh, speed or energy efficiency, what you'd find is that throughout evolution it vacillates. Um, but it's pointless to try and, 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 and look at this like a ladder or say that something's more evolved than something else. Um, yes, I get what you're saying, but my point of view is more or less in the sense of not evolutionary as in the physical sense, but evolutionary as in the spiritual sense. What, what's that mean? I should let you ask that. Well, no, like, no, um, you it. have people who have, um, who have ascended, which ascended? that's higher on an evolutionary scale. Meaning you go literally from... What does ascended mean? Well, Who's done I, it and I, how do you I, know? Energy. I think she's defining it. Wait, say that again. When you go literally from the physical and you move into a purely energetic state from the material, okay. that example. is higher on an evolutionary scale. Can we get an example of that? Yeah, who's done that and how do you know? An example how what? Give me an example of something that, as that ascends. Like, what are we talking about? I mean, Daniel Jackson um, did it on person, Stargate. But... for instance, that uh, goes from being physical to being purely energetic. I don't understand. I've, like who? Can you give me an example of like somebody I would know or like has there? I, I'm just trying to picture what you're saying. What are you just like what process are you describing? I'm not describing anyone in particular because I can't go back and say yes this person ascended or no they did not. All I know that, is that there are many accounts of people who have. So when we Whether see or not somebody ascend. True, I can't say that. But I know that in so physics it's theoretically it's possible. Um, to convert matter to energy, yes. Yeah, matter to energy conversion, you're right. Within physics, that's possible. Uh, however, what, what you seem to be talking about when you talk about an, a, a conversion of matter to energy um, is that there's something about the personhood that remains, some kind of ascendancy would, would I think, if I'm understanding you, imply um, a soul or, or some sort of something of me that is still me continues on. That's not supported by physics or any science. Certainly not medicine. I mean, the, the, there have been claims, I suppose, of people who, um, first of all, you, you're talking about spiritual evolution and higher planes. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ignore all the little trouble points um, and just go ahead and say, okay, um, if somebody ascended to energy, um, we'll go ahead and call that. It doesn't matter to me whether it's higher or lower. Um, the fact is, what reason do you have for thinking that it can occur, does occur, or has occurred? And the only thing you came up with is that there were accounts of it, and you don't know for sure if they're true or not. Well, there's oh, accounts no, of... only because I wasn't there. I can't say, I won't say something is true if I wasn't there. And there's no physical evidence saying that it can so, happen. So you wouldn't say that the Holocaust happened? Well, there's physical evidence showing that it did. You and weren't you have there. people who had firsthand accounts. Now, that makes a difference. There's physical evidence. Okay. So, so why... You said earlier that you knew that people had ascended. And now, now you've kind of backed off, and that's fine. I, I, don't, I'm not, I promise I'm not trying to dog you. I'm trying to get to the meat of this, and that is, do you believe that people have ascended or not? I believe that it is possible. And that's okay. all that I'm saying. Do you believe that anything is possible? My belief in God comes from a stance of possibilities, not necessarily concrete. Yes, no. It comes from mainly a field of possibility. Fairies what's possible, possible, what's not. So, so do you think fairies are possible? Do I think what's possible? Fairies. fairies. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Well, at least we, yeah, that gives us at least a framework from where you're, where you're coming from. 
It's possible, yes. I won't say that it isn't. Well, do you believe it's in theories? It's hard for me to say that it is. I'm sort of in between you and in between someone who would definitely say something is possible. I'm just, well, I, I, just have have Go ahead. I just have one question then. Would you say that you believe a God exists? Yes, and purely on the, the, pot, the, on the, the reason that I would say that is because of my personal experience. And okay. that cannot be transferred to another person. So when someone else says that they don't, then if they haven't had a personal experience, I can't knock them for that. No, I, I just want to make sure. So if I understand you correctly and tell me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is that you, you are comfortable saying that you believe a God exists due to your personal experience. That would be your main reason. Due to my personal experience and the fact that I believe that theoretically, in physics, it is possible. But if we don't know what a God is, then... But, I didn't want to get into a lot of the other stuff that, you know, that I look into or read or delve into or whatever, but um, a little bit of it would be the fact that I think people get confu confused by saying that something is God when it's not God. But if we don't know and what God is, how do we know what is God? What I mean by that is you have beings that may be on a higher scale or higher level than we are that do things that we would think, oh, well, only God could do that. No, just somebody that knows more than you do. How would, we, how would anybody make a claim to say that God could do anything if we have no God to examine? I wouldn't say that God exists in the traditional Christian sense. I would say that God exists as a void of all possibilities. So this and is a, it is, it like is a strategy humans caller that bring those time. possibilities. I agree. God reality. exists as a void. Okay. Now, now wait a it second. Are, 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 are you are you simply it's nowhere? Are you simply saying that God is then your uh, model of all possi all logical possibilities? Yes. Okay. So and that's what God means to you. It's a human being that brings that possibility into being with their own mind. So you think that human beings, with the power of their own mind, can bring possibilities into existence? Yes, yeah, mental models. So you're one, you're one of the people who enjoyed What the Bleep Do We Know? Mm -hmm. uh, never mind. No. There's a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know, which goes through this same nonsense of... Of, of the human mind bringing possibilities into manifestation. Oh, I'm not I sure. Think, no, I, I, just, I just read theoretical physics books, but I don't, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I think, if I understand you right, all you're saying is that to you, God is the set of all logically possible items. Yes, and I think it's the human that ac actually brings it into being. What do you mean by brings it into being? You can, as a human, you have the power to bring that po whatever possibility into being. You have the, you have the power to do so. Okay, so when you say that, do you mean bring it into being as a mental model? Bring it into reality as a physical model. Have you ever seen that happen? Have I ever seen it? Ha I've experienced it. I mean, I guess on the one hand, what I think of when you're talking well, about, yeah. wait, let me just see. Mm. One thing that I can think of, like this pen, for example, at some point was a mental model that somebody brought into existence. So that would be an example of the process that I'm familiar with. In other words, someone thought of this pen before the pen was produced. Um, yeah. Is that what you mean? Um, that could be part of what I, I mean, you could view it that way, but you could also view it as um, going from thought form straight into the material form. I have no concept of what you're talking about at this point. I mean, I don't, I've never seen that occur. But I cannot say that, that I am capable of doing such because I have not ever done anything like that. I've never seen I anyone do it. I just believe that it's, it's possible. So, but, well, do you, do you think anybody's done this? But I, I plan this? on working on it to see if I can eventually get that to happen. Do, do you think somebody's it. done this? Have I what? Do you believe that somebody has achieved this? Of course. I mean, there are millions of humans. Why, why do you believe that somebody has, by the power of their mind, managed to Ooh. turn the possible directly into the material, real existence? Because anything is possible, according to physics. You believe it because it's possible. That's your only reason? Well, I'm not saying that it definitely happened, but it's 
You just but did again, say. Going back no, no, no. You are saying. Thing. You are saying it definitely happens. I specifically asked if you believed that people had done this, and your answer was, of course. Not, it's possible. I asked if you believed it, and you said, of course, and now you're saying, well, I didn't say they really could do well, it. Well, it's hard to get into all of the theoretical physics involved. You don't need to you get into where, any, where my answers are coming from. You don't from, need to get into wait, any theoretical I, I need to, physics. Let me, just, I, let me just make one point here, and I just want to make sure that this is clear. What is logically possible has zero bearing on what is real. What is logically impossible has a great deal of bearing on what is actually real. Okay. Many things are logically possible that are not real. Just because something is possible does not mean that it has happened, that it is going to happen, and, or that it, you know, that it ha is happening. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that's logically possible, or even physically possible. It doesn't mean it's happening or that it's going to happen ever. I get that point. OK, I just want to make sure we're okay. clear. I just, uh, Does she have a I just think that when, when people start saying that God is a physical being that interferes in our lives on a daily basis, it strays away in some, in, in my mind, it strays away from what I think the true God is. Well, now, how can you say really that? Because, well, no, no, she's really saying it strays away from what she thinks. It doesn't matter what she thinks. You also think that it's possible for people to bring these concepts into reality on their own. So these people who have the idea that God is a being who manifests and interferes with reality, surely you have to think that that's possible if they're doing it. I mean, you, you've got inconsistent positions there. What, what theoretical physics have you, have you got like a book recommendation for what I could read to, do, to, to be able to transition theoretical physics into theology? Um, Brian Greene is a good author, but he really mainly just talks about super string theory. Um, let me see who is another good author. Uh, it'd be nice, it, I tell you what, find, find one that you think um, really ties together your concept of God with actual physics um, and email it to us. You can email tv at atheist-community.org. Yeah, there it is. Um, and I'll read it and talk about it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know. Uh, we've got like 18 minutes no, left. No, let's do calls. It's yeah, there's, there's people a bit on hold. So we got Juanita? Yes. How you doing? How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I was, I was just tuning in to you guys because I always watch the station. And... Um, I listen to you. I listen to your conversations, and I think they're very intellectual. Inter, inter, you know, I think they're on a, a higher level than some people's learning and that some people's understanding. And I understand. I respect you. I respect you as an atheist and your experiences. And and, I, and I'm and and I and there's people that say that they're Christians, and then they'll cuss you out. You know, they'll say one thing about God, and then the next thing you make them angry, and they'll cuss you out. And so, but they'll still call themselves a Christian. But Mine is totally different from that. Mine okay. is a realm that well, when I... Can I, I was just going to say thanks, but go ahead. Mine is a totally different experience. You see, when I was born, and, and I can't explain it, there's always been something that makes me feel, you know, like, like I have morals. Like if I do something wrong, it would be like my mother's disciplining me, but she's not there. And I, I, I mean, I, I tried to explain to my brother, and he's an, he was an atheist, and he just passed away on the 25th. And I'm I sorry never, to hear that. that's okay. I never tried my, I never tried to infringe on him, and he respected mine. And we never argued about it because we, I, 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 I embraced his, and he understood mine. And we never fought about it because I felt like the more. Uh, I try to explain it, the more we're going to get a heated conversation. So I just had to live what I felt. And it, this feeling that I have, I'm going to tell you, sometimes in the middle of the night, and, and, and some people call it a sixth sense, but I, and I was so scared to say it because people say, oh, you're bipolar, or you're schizophrenic, or you're this or you're that. And, and, and once I come into the reality of who I am as a person now, it's a total different experience to me as it is to you. And I, I'm, I'm respecting what you're saying on, te on television as an atheist. And because and, it makes me wonder, and I have, I have thought that where do we actually come from? But that, to me, is so high up at, 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 at thinking. Because I'm just at, at the basics in regards to I know that he talks to me. I know that something 
talks to me. I know that something guides me, and I know that something makes me aware that, you know. Can, can, I, I, can I ask, just so that I understand what you're talking about, um, when you say he talks to you, um, do you mean you actually hear a voice, or you feel impressions of what you think I, God wants? I feel wants impressions. You? Okay. I feel impressions. And, I, and, I'd say, actually, um, I, I don't see anything particularly abnormal about most of what you said. I mean, I, and see, you, and that's you probably, what my brother felt also. You probably don't don't realize this having not watched the show for a lot, but both of us were Christians for a great many years. And I, 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 but you know what? I did. I listened to you, and I became more understanding and more yeah. knowledgeable because I, I I didn't want to argue. I just wanted to understand, yeah. and even that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to understand with my brother the way he was feeling, and I, but I also want him to respect the way I felt, and that's how we were able to come together, and my experience was that I felt, and I, I, can't, I can't prove it, but I, I watched my brother pass away on the 25th, and it was such a beautiful experience because as he passed away from cancer, I don't think that the cancer killed him, but I believe that he was ready, it was, that he was ready to go, and when he got ready to go, he explained the realm that only I, as a child, was thought that I was like, oh, my God, I, what are you talking about? They're going to call you crazy. They're going to call you schizophrenic. They're going to call you, you better not say that. You know, they're going to dope you up with some, you know, some drugs. And, and what happened was it confirmed to me of my belief and my experience. And so, therefore, there's nothing, and I, please don't get me wrong when I say this, there's nothing that you can say to doubt me now because I had that experience. And there's probably nothing I can tell you to make you feel different about your experience. But I'm telling I respect yours. Well, I don't know. You could give us evidence. I mean, I, 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 I don't mean to, to, to you know, be short with that, but it's not, it like, it's not like my mind's closed. I'd never reject good evidence for something. No, that's you are so, I listen to you. Your conversation is so intellectual. It, I mean, excuse me, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm educated, but to the, to the evolution and different things like that, that's such a higher calling to me, I mean, a higher level. Because mine was just, I'm, I'm telling you, it's not the manifestation that I've seen. It's the spirit realm that I felt. I've even ha actually had people communicate with me and say a word that somebody else could never understand. And, and, I, and I say that to that person, and their face changes like, how did you know? And I would be so scared to say that. You know, at first I was, because I didn't know how people would, would, would I thought that they would call me, you know, I was so uh, fearful of the word bipolar, fearful of the word of schizophrenia, fearful of those, those words that if you go to a doctor or you go to a, 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 a psychiatrist and you tell them these experiences, the first thing they want to do is put it up on a title. So I didn't do that, but I, I and I can see that I can, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable or anything. I'm, but I, I'm not uncomfortable. I just, I just really I mean, enjoy what you're talking about. I enjoy it because you're telling me from your experience. Right. Okay. All right, well, we in that case, I appreciate the call, and we hope you keep watching, and maybe I, we'll I, say I, something. I, that... I just want people. I, I'm sorry. That's all right. No, that's fine. I, I just, I just want people to understand that the difference, the the difference between you and me is nothing. Is that you have an experience and I have an experience, and it's and and. I, I was kind of getting angry at first because you were with the call and y'all was getting on this different evolutional different and I but I was feeling you and I was understanding you but mine is totally that it's a it's a to me it's it's something that I know because it, it's been with me ever since I was who I was. Okay. Okay. And uh, thank you so much because you really did enlighten me for today and you gave me hope and I know I feel my brother I feel his presence and even though he has his experience as an atheist I have mine as a Christian. So thank you. Okay. Sure. Well, thanks, Juanita. Uh, any comments on that one before we go on to the next one? The only comment that I would have on that, and, you know, I, I appreciate Juanita's call. And I appreciate her wanting to, you know, just say, hey, I'm just trying to understand. And that's something that, you know, I think is helpful. Um, the one thing I would put out to the information on that is to always remember that even though an experience might be real, does not necessarily validate the interpretation of the experience. Right. So while I would never doubt anyone's experience, well, as long as, you know, like, like along the lines of what Juanita is describing, I wouldn't doubt that. But I would caution that with, sometimes with more information comes a different interpretation of data. Yeah, and at the end when, when she said, you know, there's really not, the difference between us is nothing. Right. I'd say that that, if there is a significant difference, um, I'd say that that's it. Um, 
I'm not going to, if somebody comes to me and says, I believe in God, and it's all because of things that I've experienced, there's absolutely nothing I can say. I haven't had their experiences, um, and until I do, I can't possibly judge them. And I couldn't even know that I had the same experiences if I did, because we're different people. Um, so you can't argue against that. And if your belief is because God talks to you, or you've had an experience that you are completely convinced is God, um, there is no argument against that. That's not, that has nothing to do with uh, reality or uh, reason or evidence or anything else. It's a personal thing. And it's like we, we tend to rely on our. But our it is an interpretation. Like and interpretations that's, can change. That's the critical you know, part. I might, I might interpret my spouse as being a loving, faithful husband. And then I find a receipt from a hotel room that wasn't where he was supposed to be this weekend. We and suddenly, have... suddenly my interpretation changes yeah. because I got different information or more information on it that made me stop and reconsider how I was interpreting this previously. And that's, that's all I'm saying. When, when someone says, you know, hey, I don't, I don't have this type of information, and I might not have all the information you have, but I have this experience, my point would be, go get some more information and see what the experience means the more you learn, because um, it, can, it can morph. Well, we're running short on time, and we've got callers. I'm going to get to you right in just a second, I promise. As a reminder, uh, we're going to dinner after the show, uh, Thread Gills on Riverside. The address will be up on the screen in just a moment. Uh, the show's over here in about eight minutes or, or so, and we'll be down there around five o'clock. Any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to join us, and that goes for all of our regular events, including the happy hour that I forgot to announce, uh, partly because I forgot to go. Uh, but that's every Thursday at the Dog and Duck Pub at 17th and Guadalupe. Uh, Guadalupe. Uh, that's up on your screen now. And as a reminder, next week, everything changes. We're moving to Channel 16. We're moving to 4.30 to 6. If you've enjoyed watching the show, or maybe if you just get some masochistic pleasure out of watching people who you despise, we're going to move, and we'd like you to go ahead and follow us, too. Channel 16, 4.30 to 6 p.m. Come starting down. next week. Come on over. <laughs> Uh, whether you're calling to argue or tell us why you disagree or, or talk about ID or talk about ID which is what Chuck wants to do how you doing Chuck uh, hello yeah those those last uh, those last three phone calls there that's just when I tuned in that's that's living proof why we don't want uh, intelligent design in our public schools it looks like I we're mean not that's gonna get that's it. gonna set our science program back about 500 years back to whenever they the Catholic Church arrested Galileo for uh, proving that uh, the uh, earth revolved around the sun yeah okay now uh, the, the reason I'm calling is the other day I was having a debate with uh, uh, a bunch of people about like that and um, and we were talking about this intelligent design you know they're wanting to get into the public schools and I, I suddenly realized I didn't understand what is it that they want exactly. Do they want a chapter in the science book, or do they want their own class, and, and they're going to teach their own class? All right, I, I got to nutshell this because we're running out of time. What most of the ID proponents ultimately want is a complete change in the paradigm. They're using the wedge strategy. They want to eliminate evolution and replace it with creationism in the, in the guise of intelligent design and use that as the way to change moral values and other things in the systems. Barbara Forrest has got an excellent bunch of lectures, including some essays online talking specifically about the wedge document, the ID strategy, et cetera. I want to say quickly that while we were in a panic and there's still reason to be concerned about what was going on with Texas public education, this September is the month where the science standards were coming up for review, and we warned and warned and warned, and it turns out either the warnings were heated um, or they were unnecessary, despite the fact that we have seven creationists or young earth creationists possibly out of 15 slots on the school board. They put together a commission that came up with a new science standard proposal, and I'm happy to say that the new proposal not only prohibits the inter, uh, prohibits the mention of supernatural causes within a science classroom, but it also eliminates the main needle point of the wedge of intelligent design, which has been a part of, of, the, of the Texas standards for a while, and that is to teach the strengths and weaknesses of evolution. That's now been removed from what they're proposing, and this is up for approval in January, Texas may, may actually get away um, next January 
with not looking at all like Kansas or Florida or any of these other backward places that have abandoned a 20, 21st century science education in favor of uh, kowtowing to people's religious beliefs. So there's, there's some potential good news on that front. Well, yeah, it, 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 hopefully Texas uh, will, you know, uh, do the right thing. And uh, uh, so, so they, were, they were actually wanting to impose their will into the textbook. Is that, is that what I heard you say? I think they have their own books, or I don't know. They, they have their own books, but, what, but if, if the standards changed, then the textbooks would have to change. If the requirement is that we teach in the course on evolution both the strengths and weaknesses, and, and by the way, go ahead and identify them, um, then, you, yeah, you've got to produce new textbooks that do that, and what they end up doing is providing supplementary material like of pandas and people. Right, uh, so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to force their will into the textbook. Because what I was, one of my arguments was, you know, sure, let them have a, a class and teach their own little class and make it an elective class because nobody will take it anyway. <laughs> but, and they, they realized that. They realized that if they had an elective class in the public school, nobody would take it. Well, so I they're think trying we have to, to force careful, their way into the textbook. I think we have to be careful, though, about what electives we allow. We don't want to allow... Uh, a religious proselytizing class as an elective because that's something we're still paying for. If you want to do that, if you want to have Sunday school, do it on Sundays. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, sure. Yeah. All I right. got to let you go, Chuck. We're about out of time. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, Pete, you there? Hello, huh? Yeah. You got like 30 seconds to make a point. Sorry, I apologize. Right. Well, you know, that Diane gal, I don't think you should have cut her off like that. You should have, like, tried to stay cool and calm and tried to... Uh, reason things out with her. I mean, like, when somebody, you know, thinks that their days are numbered, you know, I mean, they can, it's a pretty powerful force, you know, that people have this, uh, you know, I mean, they're going to, you know, their days are numbered, then they're going to Your pass. days are numbered. <laughs> Sorry, I did that not just for comic effect, but we're just about out of time, and <laughs> I wanted to add on this real quick. Uh, I, I apologize. Uh, you know, maybe we cut Diane off too early. I don't know. I thought she had a really long time to talk. Most shows, you're going to get a couple of minutes. I'd actually rather move yeah. us towards having a couple of minutes to talk um, so that we can get more callers in rather than keeping people on hold for, for 15 or 20 minutes. And if that means getting off the phone, recollecting your thoughts, and calling back in, um, I'm fine with that. Yeah. As a reminder, next week, everything changes. Channel 16, 4.30 to 6 p.m. We're going to be going to Thread Gills here very shortly. There's a list of the crew. Is there a picture of the crew? There they Yay. are. Oh, they have cool little glasses on. You guys are sexy. <laughs> we'll see you all next week on our new time and channel. Be safe.